Um, so to tell you a little bit about um, myself, I'm, my name's Sarah Russin. I'm the executive director of LACE. And uh, LACE stands for Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. And we've been around since 1978, the organization. Uh, so it was founded in downtown LA uh, by a bunch of artists. Um, some went to Otis. There were a lot of um, Chicano artists in LA, Harry Gamboa, Gronk. Um, uh, Patsy Valdez was involved. So um, a lot of like really important artists who are getting more and more attention actually got their start at LACE and start actually started LACE. And then it, it um, kind of evolved from a purely artist run space to um, a place that had an executive director and a staff and um, a lot of amazing artists and um, arts administrators have worked at LACE over the years. We moved from downtown LA to Hollywood in 1993. Um, it's kind of crazy to think about now, but I think at the time the homeless situation was really intense downtown and Lace was um, very isolated. Um, it, right now, the area where Lace was is the heart of the arts district downtown, but back then there wasn't much there. So artists were living in downtown LA, but, um, but there, wa there weren't galleries, there wasn't a lot of activity. So Lace was very isolated. So they decided to move. Um, so we've now been on Hollywood Boulevard for longer than we were downtown. Um, and just recently, we've moved out of our space temporarily because we're undergoing a massive renovation, and um, that'll take about a year, and we're going to be part of something called the Hollywood Arts Collective um, that'll have a black box theater and another gallery space and some other nonprofits involved. Uh, the Actors Fund is one of the um, developers on the project. And then behind us, for any of you who might live in LA or have artist friends in LA, um, there's, uh, they're building a 150 unit apartment building that will be 100% affordable housing specifically for artists. And um, I think it'll be artists, musicians, that kind of thing. And it'll be a lottery system if people qualify financially for that. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a cool thing because it's very rare to have housing just for artists. And it's very rare to have these new buildings go up that are 100% affordable. So I uh, just wanted to share that with you. Um, so that's like about our physical space. Um, our, our history has really been all about um, experimentation uh, and around uh, giving people opportunities that were kind of shut out of the art world, you know, in the, in the early 80s, um, you know, women <laughs> were not really getting a lot of opportunities, queer artists, Black artists, Latinx artists, um, Asian artists, I mean, you know, so Lace was kind of a place where people could have, um, have an opportunity. Um, video art was new, uh, installation art was new. I love watching someone paint while we're talking. That's super awesome. What's your name, William? <laughs> um, love that. Um, so that's kind of the history of the, the kinds of work that we show. There have been different directors and curators over the years. Uh, when I came on to LACE eight years ago, um, I don't come from a like straight curatorial background. I come more from like an arts administrator and arts education background. And, um, but I heard about this job and I said, I really love LACE and I wanna, I'd love to run this place. And so they kind of, we've kind of evolved the, the, our board to a different model where um, I'm the director and then we have a chief curator and I can talk to you all about curating. I know a lot of people want to know about curating um, and how that relationship works is that um, really the curator and I together kind of shape the direction of the organization as far as what, what kinds of things we'll be exhibiting. But of course, the curator is the one that really puts it together and does the research. And um, uh, our curator is uh, Daniela Lieja Quintanar. She's from Mexico City. She came to LA to do the USC curatorial master's program. 
And um, we met actually when she applied for our emerging curators program. And we didn't, we select one project a year for that program. And um, she was not selected, but we really liked her project. So what I do is I usually will call people who, you know, we didn't select, but we liked the project just to say, hey, you know, like maybe we can work together in the future or, um, you know, maybe we can do a scaled down version of your project, which we actually ended up doing uh, with her project. And then my curator left and I ended up hiring Daniela to be our curator. So um, the small lesson in that story is um, about putting yourself out there for opportunities. And even if you don't like win, get the, you know, the prize, whatever, then you're just, you're, you're still making yourself visible. And um, so I admire all of you who submitted work for this show and um, put yourselves out there. And, um, you know, it's just like all these art prizes and awards and things like people do get to know your work and your name and your face um, over time. So um, I'm a big, big believer in that. Uh, and I know we'll probably be some questions around that arena. Is that enough basic background around lace? I don't know if people looked at our website at all. The website is a, it's a fascinating place to, to spend an afternoon. Um, There's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. I was hoping um, you could say a little bit more about the, um, the incubation work that you do with uh, young curators and just maybe outline like practically what is the support that lace gives to that person and then yeah what does that then do for that person what what do they what's the outcome of that investment yeah so uh when i started at lace i um designed this program called the emerging curators program and really the idea was that um i didn't want to necessarily do a lot of open calls for artists so this was a way to do an open call for proposals for a show that would open up our organization to some other voices, right? So you have a chief curator and they have, you know, our curator, Daniela, has her own specific areas of interest and research over time. There's a connection between shows so we wanted creators vision but still within what i would call the lace wheelhouse so um the emerging curators program we offer someone five thousand dollars to do a show um, that's all the expenses so the first thing is people say well what's an emerging curator mm -hmm. and i say if you think $5,000 is a lot to work with for a show, then you're an emerging curator. <laughs> um, if some people are like, oh, you can't do a show for that. You actually can do a show for that. Um, so the $5,000 budget, um, we insist that the curator take a fee for themselves. This is a very important because um, we're uh, encouraging professional development. Uh, a lot of times curators are like, oh, I want to do more things for my show and they don't want to take the fee. And I'm like, sorry, that's part of the deal. You have to. Um, so that cuts down the amount of money they have to work with. And then um, they, you know, the, the project is selected. We have usually a panelist, uh, three panelists. Um, I always invite an artist who was in a past show to be on the panel, which is interesting because a lot of artists have never been on panels like this and it's a great experience for them uh, to be on the other side to see how juries work and what kinds of conversations happen around selecting a project and uh, then we'll have a curator um, you know working in LA usually and then often uh, the third person will be a professor at one of the art schools or um, universities here um, who is interested in experimental art projects. Last year, we had a, a, a professor, um, Uli, uh, Uri McMillan, who is at UCLA and teaches gender studies, but, but he's very interested in performance art, which is one of the things that we do at LACE. 
Um, so we have our panel and um, after we select the project, we have about a year to work with the curator. And, um, you know, we'll do initial meetings with my team. We're very, very small. It's me, the curator and two other people. There's a communications um, coordinator. And then there's a exhibitions and operations manager who um, uh, is responsible for installing most of our shows or coordinating that installing. And so together we'll meet with our emerging curator just to talk through um, all the practical things. So I will be the, the, the person who will always have questions around safety. <laughs> and, you know, like there's always artists and curators who want to dig a hole in the, you know, like make a hole in the gallery floor. And I'm like, okay, let's like, how do we keep people from falling in the hole? You know, very funny things like that, or like having access to the fire exit. It sounds really dumb, but there's, oh, the projects are always really out there and inventive and people want to experiment with the space. So um, I'm involved with that. And, and then very pragmatic things around the budget, um, helping a new curator have a realistic sense of what it costs to do certain things. Uh, like, you know, what are our fees for artists? So every artist who, who participates in a, a, a show with us is paid a fee. Um, and the fee could be anywhere from like $150 to $450 uh, around there. And um, it, it really depends on if um, they have to come and install their piece. Um, there may, there would definitely be a larger fee if um, someone is doing a commission, right? Creating a new work for the exhibition, that would be a much higher fee. There may be materials costs that we need to um, supply to the artist uh, for an installation, for example. Um, if it's a performance, do they need musicians? Do they need costumes? Do they need other kinds of support? Do we have to rent equipment or do we have everything? Um, so those are all the kinds of things that we help that curator with. And then, um, you know, we're actually installing the show with them, for them, um, and then uh, promoting the show. So all of the marketing and social media that would go behind making sure we have an audience for um, the exhibition and then also helping them develop programming. So almost every exhibition that we would do, we would also have programming that could include artist talks, tours. Um, it could include something musical. Um, our last Emerging Curators program, they it was uh, two um, black curators and an all black artist lineup. And they had a, um, a performer they wanted to bring to LACE. And this was, you know, still during COVID last fall. So it was a little challenging. So we limited the amount of people um, in the gallery. It was this beautiful singer. And she said, I want a Hammond organ. <laughs> and so we were like, okay. And we <laughs> had to like go and rent a Hammond organ, which costs like, you know, 400 bucks for just the evening. And um, you know, making decisions like, is something worth it? You know, and we felt like this project was a um, singer who'd grown, grown up like singing in church and black church and um, on in West LA and Inglewood. And we're like, okay, that's what the work is about. And so she did a combination of Hammond organ, electronic music and a live cello. And so we paid those musicians as well for that project. So that would be like an example of programming that was, you know, a little bit more complex that was part of the emerging curators presentation. Yeah. I think within that, um, that description, there's a question that I think I can hear bubbling up from practically every artist. Yeah. Is how do they develop a relationship with curators so that they are called upon to be in those, in yeah. those shows? How do artists position themselves? How do they network? How do they, Physically connect with and how do you find who these curators are? Yeah, they put their hand up and say, I've got money for an art show, who wants to be involved? How does that yeah. work? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And it's not an easy answer. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I will tell you that, um, you need to go out to things, 
you know, and so now that we're becoming in person again, um, you, you need to physically go and meet people. And um, I know that a lot of artists are introverts and it's like literally torture to go to uh, an opening and like make small talk with people and um, feel like you're being um, uh, pushy or obnoxious about your work. Or I know people are really worried about all that stuff. Um, I would say like, you don't come to an opening and then try to show your portfolio to the gallery director that you don't do. That's like a protocol thing. I know. I love that you're laughing, Linda, but people have done it. I've had people try to show me the portfolios while I'm opening somebody else's show. Um, but what you do though is, I, I mean, I, I believe in it's like being yourself and, um, you know, coming to things that you're authentically interested in. So like, just don't come to shows that aren't your thing. Like come to thing, come to shows that where you really like the work, you know, it looks like from the website that it's something interesting to you. Either your work has is similar or you just like it and you want to meet the artist, you want to meet the gallery people. Um, there's the commercial gallery world, and then there's the, you know, nonprofit world, which I'm in. Um, they do kind of connect in some ways. Um, we try not to be affected by the marketplace uh, in terms of our decision making. And that's generally what museums are supposed to do is to, um, you know, um, show work that meets certain criteria for them that does not have to do with the marketplace. So that's like a whole other 12 hour discussion, but um, how do you meet curators? Well, first of all, where are curators? Curators are with institutions like ours, but then there's this whole swath of independent curators that are out there doing stuff. And you know what, they show their friends and they put projects together with their friends and with, and then sometimes they're looking for artists who will flesh out a thesis or a, um, you know, a direction that they're researching or exploring. And so they may have often like what I would call an anchor artist or two in mind to um, make a show, but then they're looking for more artists to kind of complement um, the, the full exhibition. So that would be like in a group show situation. Um, so in terms of coming out to things, one little uh, tip that I give the introverted artists where this is like really torture for them is to bring an extroverted friend with you. <laughs> And so you go in together and, um, and, you know, um, it's hard if you're like, if you're living up in Ventura County and you're, and you're coming into LA for stuff and you don't know people, then, you know, it is a little more challenging because you're coming in cold. Um, it's great when you know, like somebody, um, and then, what often happens is like the more you go to stuff, the more people you meet. Um, in fact, I have a board member uh, who I met because I would go to shows and she was just at everything. And she was there with her husband and her two boys. And these boys got dragged to so many art shows. And um, I was just like, who is this woman? She's everywhere. And uh, you know, we met and she ended up joining um, our board because I just like was so impressed. She knows more about contemporary art than um, than a lot of my peers <laughs> who work in nonprofit do. Um, anyway, I think I digress, Peter. Bring me back on track. We were talking about how do artists meet curators? Yeah, I was just remembering that I was one of those boys growing up where I was dragged to exhibitions by parents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I before the age of about 14, I would take a book and they'll be, they'd be there in a contemporary art exhibition in a corner, sitting down, ignoring <laughs> everything and reading a book. Yeah. 
I kind of changed when I got a bit older, but um, <laughs> just reminded me of those people that you see who bring their families to things. And it's, it's, uh, it's quite, it's and you know, those kids absorb stuff, you know, whether they're actively engaging with it or not, there's, they're still going to that exposure means a lot and it still kind of gets in there. Uh, so I believe that very much. Particularly when um, you carry it at the end of the night as well. You help yeah. Um, I would love if any of you want to poke at me more about how you meet curators and how do you, cause I know it sounds, it sounds really hard and it sounds like, or it sounds like I'm making it sound easy, like just show up and go to things, but you know, you need other artists to be generous with each other. So this is like a very important thing. Sometimes people are competitive and it's human nature maybe. Um, but I think a lot of the really successful artists that I know are also really supportive of other artists, um, artists that are their personal friends, but also just other artists that they meet that whose work they admire. And um, you never, I believe you never lose out by being generous. You never lose out by sharing, you know. I agree with you completely there, Sarah, because when we put together shows and we've got our anchor artists sorted out, we'll go out and we'll research who we want to bring in to add flavor, different notes. And then we'll present that list to the anchor artists and say, these are the people we want to bring into this show. Yeah. And at that point, the artist who is, you know, they, they've been there from the beginning has that choice of saying, well, you know, I don't want those people in the show because they'll compete with me because their work's really good. And I think that's where you see that and you're like, you see it in their eye that, they, that but the, the, the artists that we really like working with are the ones that say, well, that work would really stand next to mine very well, or that works so different, but I really like it. And so what we really look for is artists that will tell us, well, I've always wanted to show with that artist, or I've always wanted to be. Yeah. And so I think as artists, if you can identify other artists who you'd like your work to be hung with, and then yeah. when you talk to people, it's not just about you, it's about the community and trying to show a really great exhibition. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, um, it, and, and I think that a lot of times artists think that, you know, there's the, for lack of a better word, the gatekeepers, like I'm a gatekeeper, you know, who gets a show at our um, space. And then there's like the people trying to crash the gates, you know, and get in and like that they're in these op oppositional um, spaces. But, but really like we're all part of an art community and the, the artists who get the shows and the artists who don't, haven't had that opportunity yet are still part of the same community. And obviously there are also lots of sub communities, you know, um, there are, um, just like the early days of Lace where, you know, Chicano artists in LA were like, hey, there's not much happening for us. So we're going to make our own thing. Um, that's, that's all also very much so happening now. And I'm not going to say young artists. I'm going to say any artists uh, who haven't had opportunities yet to show you know it's also you can make your own opportunities you don't always have to wait for the gatekeepers to let you in um so it, it's it's one of the it's one of the special things about la i think or you know southern california is that i mean first of all we have this beautiful weather right i'm uh, out, out my office is off the garden my home office and you know, when I moved here from the East Coast 30 years ago, uh, I was like, oh, wow, I can have a studio in a garage and open up the garage door and like paint in January. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Um, I think that um, there's an optimism and there's a um, entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial spirit of like Southern California for people to create their own things. And um for some people, that's like enough to even have the entrepreneurial opportunities and show their work in that setting. But you, you can also see how some of those things become springboards for uh, larger or um, um, more commercial, maybe, or more, or more critically um, reviewed uh, shows. So 
you know, it, 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 it can, those entrepreneurial things can lead to other opportunities. Um, I just met, um, do you guys know about freeze the art fair? Yep. Okay. So did anybody come up for that crazy freeze this year with the masks on, which sucked. Right. Um, so I, I, I was walking around with my curator, my friend Daniela, and we stopped at this one booth and it was really interesting. And I was talking to the young guy who ran the gallery and the gallery is called garden. And um, I really liked the work. And then I found out that the gallery's in his house, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a house gallery in Mount Washington. And um, so that's his space. So he's not renting some gallery in LA and spending money on rent, but he got into freeze. And um, a lot of the reviews of the art fair actually mentioned his gallery specifically and the artists that he was highlighting because it was really fantastic work, but it's a very um, little known artist. And um, he is a very, you know, small entrepreneurial gallery space out of his house and so that you know getting himself to freeze um you know and of course there are questions like how did he get there well there was somebody who was selecting la galleries to so there's always gatekeeping right uh, you know that's happening but you know one opportunity can lead to another is my point and him getting uh himself into freeze actually did amazing things for the artist um, that he was showcasing in that space. And they sold all her work <laughs> from that, from that show, which is really cool. And she's very deserving of that. I think that what you're saying there about um, an artist having a, a studio and an ex having a home space mm -hmm. kind of segues into this, the next question that I wanted to raise, yeah. which was about, um, you know, an artist who exhibits in their own space has, control over their own exhibition space can present their work very rapidly upon its completion and they can respond to events and they can create very contemporary work. But we live in a world where um, most galleries program 12 to 36 months out from the right. time right. we're now. And artists are constantly trying to make work which is relevant to what's happening right now. We're living in a very fast paced changing world. So there's this time problem that artists often face where they come and they say i want to have a show as quickly as i can because this work is relevant right now and then the gallery is placed in the position of it'd be great but we've got to push somebody else out to bring you in um, uh, so i'm just wondering if we could like have that conversation about what you would say to artists in terms of um you know what i would say about? don't worry about that stuff at all <laughs> <laughs> because you just need to make the work that you need to make and not worry about, is it um, marketable in a moment, right? Um, my husband is a screenwriter and we laugh because when he came to LA as a young writer, everyone said to him, don't write sports movies, especially baseball movies. And then the following year, all these baseball movies came out like, you know, Field of Dreams, like all these like really wonderful baseball movies and sports movies. And so the, the point of my little story there that's not about the art world is, you know, you just have to write and make the things that you want to make and um, let everybody else catch up with you, you know. Um, and I think the only the only time, Peter, where that became very obvious to me in my work was during COVID, where I had, um, you know, it was all intense for all of us, right? Uh, we had a whole spring program scheduled for, you know, that was supposed to open in April 2020. And we have also obviously had to cancel the, the project. Um, um, and we, the art, one of the artists, um, in the project was calling me and she's like, well, I still want to do something. And I have this COVID project and she was kind of pressuring me to like do it uh, right away. And, and I was just like, Hey, you know, look, we could do this in a month or two maybe, but right now I have to figure out how to like make payroll <laughs> and make sure my team 
is like, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Like we're dealing with like this crisis. We don't know how long it's going to go. You know, I took a pay cut to make sure that my team would get paid and we wouldn't do any layoffs. So, um, you know, I, I couldn't really deal with this artist pressuring me because she felt that this work that she wanted to present was, was relevant to the COVID moment. She didn't know, and I didn't know, none of us knew like this thing was going to go on and on and on. And we could very well have presented that project in a year after mm -hmm. um, the COVID shutdown, but she felt very much, very, very intensely that it had to be done right away. And it was a, it was a sound project that we could have done, you know, like we were doing some experimental kind of things because we couldn't be in the, in the physical space. But I mean, so that may have been of a moment in, in the artist's mind, but in general, I mean, I think that, um, you know, your work will either connect with people in a universal kind of way, um, or it's just important for you to make in a given moment to explore something for yourself. And I don't really think you should worry at all about whether it's relevant for a particular moment in terms of a, you know, a, a one year or two year planning timeline for galleries. I don't think you should worry about that at all. Now, that's not to say that there isn't, um, I'm gonna call it like fashion. There's things in fashion uh, in the art world and there are trends and that's a real thing. But I would discourage anybody from trying to jump on a trend. Um, you know, you just do your thing. I mean, that's really what being an artist is about. I mean, it sounds kind of obvious, but I, I deeply believe that um, people who are trying to second guess the market, it's a very cynical approach to art making. So I um, don't subscribe to that. <laughs> <laughs> um the next question that I wanted to touch on was um, around LACE's relationship with other institutions. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. LACE is very adept at building collaborations and um, creating um, opportunities. And I was just hoping you could just say a bit about how do you select which institutions you're going to work with? How do you go about starting those collaborations? You know, how do they develop? And then, you know, what, what, why do you get into a collaboration? You know, what do you? What can you do with another organization that you can't do it by yourself, which makes it so worthwhile doing that? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for that. I, I consider that a compliment. If you think we're adept at that, I'm curious how you have that impression. Like, what? How do you know that? Um, reading through your website, um, and it it seems that what Lace is doing is feeding other institutions by investing in um, uh, exhibitions which have a relationship with another organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, right now, because we're out of our physical space, we um, have to collaborate <laughs> if, we want, if we want to have a physical um, manifestation of something in, in, real, in what I call in 3D as opposed to the, this world. Um, so we have a performance, uh, our upcoming Emerging Curators presentation that's happening in April um, will happen at LAX Art, which is, can you hear the helicopters or not? Yeah, here. we can Sorry. hear the helicopters. They're not Hello. coming for you, are they? No, <laughs> I, I live near a hospital. <laughs> um, so... Um, this um, performance um, of Emerging Curators Program uh, will be at LAX Art, which is another um, smallish nonprofit that's close to us and we're friends uh, with them. Um, during COVID, um, I joined this group called the Lava Coalition. Uh, and it was basically people like me, executive directors of mostly smaller art spaces who were freaking out. And um, so we started meeting once a week. Um, so we met once a week together 
between March and December of 2020. And then we started like meeting a little less frequently, but um, uh, the idea was to um, support each other through this time and share, um, you know, everything from like how we're dealing with safety issues in our spaces to fundraising crisis and um, how to work with our teams to get through this time. Um, and, um, you know, through this, I mean, a lot of these people were my friends already, but we've become closer. Um, you know, we also realized like how, how much more we could do together, you know, as spaces that are interested in a lot of similar things. So LAXR is um, gonna present with us. Um, we'll have another project uh, with another nonprofit um, that we'll be presenting. But I think what you might be talking about more, Peter, is things like, um, like we have a little partnership with the, uh, it's called the Southern California Library. And it's, um, it's quite interesting. It's a, it's a library in South Los Angeles um, that serves, you know, primarily black uh, community and, and, and Central American community there. And their whole thing is, um, it's, it's really almost like an archive around social justice issues. And we had borrowed uh, some newspapers from them for an exhibition we did in 2018 uh, around the artist Emery Douglas. Um, I don't know if you guys know who that is, but Emery Douglas was one of the uh, Black Panther leaders who was their designer. Like he, um, he designed all of the newspapers and created the kind of graphic identity for the Black Panthers. And so our curator wanted to do a show around him and she just got in touch with him and we, we did a show in our storefront right on Hollywood Boulevard of um, Emery Douglas. And then we invited a few um, contemporary artists who were kind of inspired by his work and activism to, um, um, to be part of it, to have their work in dialogue with Emery Douglas's work from the time. And um, these Black Panther newspapers are actually difficult to find. You know, first of all, they're newspaper and they've deteriorated, right, since the 60s and uh, 70s. Um, but this library had them. They have like a whole collection of them. So our curator uh, contacted them and borrowed some of the actual uh, newspapers with Emery's drawings, um, uh, illustrations there, and we showed them in our exhibition. So that kind of started that relationship. Like there's something that we wanted to borrow from them. And I have to say, we were really impressed because um, University of California in Santa Barbara also has some of this material, but they wanted to charge us. <laughs> and even for like scans of, um, scans of posters and stuff, they wanted to charge us. And we're like, oh no, um, but the library which is a community library. They're not a city library. They're not a university connected library. They have no money there. They lent us these things without charging us. Um, and so we decided like, hey, we wanna give something back to them. So we took um, the exhibition, a portion of the exhibition and brought it to the library there and did you know a DJ party and, um, um, you know, made a show happen there in their community. Um, so, and then we did another show where they lent us materials. So, um, and during, um, after George Floyd, we decided to um, donate some of our books, bookstore proceeds to the Southern California Library to support the work that they're doing in their community. Because during COVID it was really rough for spaces like that to like continue on. Um, so that's one example. I mean, it, it's, it, it honestly happens really in an organic way, Peter. It's like, there's a certain need, you know, or connection that we have. Um, our curator did a show, um, called, um, um, unraveling collective 
knots unraveling oh my god that's so funny you know we change the titles of things sometimes mm -hmm. unraveling collective forms um it, but it was a show that involved literal and uh figurative kind of knotting and community ties that was the theme of the show uh had a lot of um uh, latinx artists and one of the um one of the organizations we work with is we did a whole talk on um um pollution in certain neighborhoods um, like near the Los Angeles port um, and there was a connection with some of the artists in the show and we did a, a thing in the gallery and it's um, it's called East Yard um, East Yard Collective or something like that so they're kind of they're not really an art group but they're more around um you know, social justice, connecting environmental and, um, you know, poverty really, like how poor areas of our city end up being the dumping grounds for toxic stuff. So LACE is very much interested, we're really interested in like social and political issues and how, how art can kind of bring people to conversations. And, um, we have another project coming up where we're going to go back to East, the East Yard folks. Um, it's a show in 2024 um, with the Getty, the Pacific Standard Time show. So we are in the research phase of that right now, and then we'll be presenting it fall 2024. Um, and we'll probably work with this organization again, East Yard. So, you know, when you have a good experience, then you want to go back to people. Um, we worked a lot with Antenna LA, which is a, um, a language justice organization. And they've been doing Spanish uh, interpretation for us for a lot of our programs. Um, we actually did one during COVID that was a trilingual um, uh, event, uh, which was quite interesting. So we had English, Spanish, and Cachaquil which is a Guatemalan indigenous language. We had a gentleman in Guatemala translating um, or interpreting live with us. So, um, which was, you know, quite interesting. And all of these partnerships do, there are surprising outcomes where you just are opening up your audience to new people all the time. So um, in addition to, groups or organizations having certain expertise that we wouldn't have that we would bring in for something or or go there for something they also bring new audiences with them so every time we do that um, people that don't know about lace or maybe don't even know much about contemporary art um, become introduced or get connected so that's that's really what it's about for me it, I'm just trying to um, pick out of that um, some things which are really interesting to me, which is that um, what you're saying about building relationships with other organizations or building relationships with artists, it's about finding a commonality and having a genuine relationship where you're not expecting something immediately, but you're yeah. open to a conversation that can flow in different directions. And yeah. you need to know what you want out of that conversation. I mean, as an artist, you need to know exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. But if you can understand what the other party wants, try and yeah. find a way to work together. Yeah. And that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, and the other thing is talking about the either thematic links. So organizations that have a similar um, you know, set of interests to you or geographic, it's just, they're just right next to you. And I think the same is true for artists. You know, artists should build thematic links where it's a broad net across you know, different counties, across different states, even internationally, where there's a strong thematic link. But then don't forget to build that network of people next door because opportunities yeah. come from very strange places sometimes. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's partly like being, you know, uh, I guess it's like dating, being open to love. <laughs> being open to the love <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i agree and i think that um i i can I think there's a lot in there for um tend to work um in isolation 
tend to work on yeah. you know, long-term project ideas. Um, and then to translate that into building sort of long-term relationships with, with organizations, I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, you know, we're all different and there's no one way to go about these things. So, you know, some people, they just need to be in their studio and like hunker down. And, you know, those are the, assuming there was some financial stability, those are the artists that got through COVID and were like totally fine. They like just, you know, and got in there and they were like, great, I don't have to go to any parties. I don't have to do any of that. And they loved it. You know, um, you know, of course, a lot of people got freaked out and made no art during COVID. I know a lot of amazing artists who just like could not function during COVID, um, you know, so we're all different. We all have our own, you know, ways of coping, but, but it is true. I'm going to give you my favorite aphorism of all time. Um, I went to this workshop several years ago. It was like one of these a workshop for artists and I sat in on it and um, after a whole weekend, this was my one takeaway, but I use it all the time. Okay, here it is. It's amazing how people are not thinking about you. <laughs> That's it. Um, yeah. So that phrase has a lot in there. It, 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 um, it, it's very layered, actually. Uh, it's amazing how people aren't thinking about you because they primarily think about themselves and they're not going to be thinking about you. So it's your job is to remind people that you're around. You have to remind people, you know, uh, it's just like a relationship. If you don't show up for stuff, if you're, if you're not there, then, you know, people are going to ignore you. You have to be visible. Um, the other part of that phrase that I think really applies to artists is that um, uh, we tend to be, or artists tend to be very, uh, what I call tender, you know, um, that um, easily um, bruised by critique, um, easily bruised by not having everyone love your work, uh, insecure, whatever word you want to use, so that, you um, if you send somebody an email and they don't answer you, you immediately go to, they don't like me, they don't like my work, you know, and you kind of like in spiral. It's like when you're applying for a job and they don't get back to you and you're like, oh, I'm not qualified or <laughs> whatever it is. And it's none of those things usually. It's usually just people are busy and they're not thinking about you <laughs> there. So um, it's a, um, message about persistence, you know, uh, and grit, um, which are qualities that I believe in, uh, to be successful in anything grit. Um, and you just can't give up, you know, mm -hmm. if it's something important to you, you just can't give up and you can't take things personally. And that's what the, it's amazing how people aren't thinking about you, someone doesn't answer your email, you send it again, you know, like, so yeah, you don't want to be annoying and, um, uh, and you don't want to push yourself on somebody who's like, it's not a good fit. You know, it just might not, it might not work out. They might not have something for you, you know? Um, and, um, and they might not answer you because they just don't know what to say, you know, because it's not a good fit. Um, that doesn't mean they don't like you and doesn't mean your work isn't good. It might just not be the right fit. Um, and so, you know, this kind of leads into like, how do you look for galleries and, you know, meeting curators and all that kind of thing that don't go to places that are showing work that is nothing like your work. I mean, galleries do tend to have a thing, you know, um, a few galleries where sometimes I scratch my head and I'm like, I'm not getting the theme because there's so much different kinds of work. And in a way that's kind of cool. You know, they're, they're open to a lot of different kinds of things. Um, 
but you know, there, there are galleries that, that show abstract work. There are galleries that show figurative work. There are galleries that specialize in works on paper or prints. Um, there are galleries that love 3D. Um, I, have a, I have a gallery I went to visit and I'm just like, hey, are you looking for new artists? Because I ask galleries that when I go visit, because I want to know, like, I have artists that I'm championing and I want them to, they may be, um, have shown in, in um, spaces like lace, but they haven't had any kind of commercial representation and they're looking for that. So I'll ask galleries like, hey, are you like looking at new artists? What are you looking for? And I had one guy totally surprised me. He goes, I really want to show a ceramic artist. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you know, um, I have somebody in mind. I'm going to send you her uh, link to her work because she's great. Um, and, you know, I don't personally get anything out of that. I mean, I'm not like, you know, her agent, not getting a commission, but I feel like that is part of my job in the art world is to, you know, connect people together and to the extent that I can, you know, I'm super busy, but, you know, all my former interns writing letters of recommendation for them when jobs come up that I think somebody would be good for trying to connect them. And, you know, if you do those things for other people, then, you know, it'll you'll be good. Some good karma will come back at you, you know, <laughs> I think, um, that phrase really tells, reminds me of um, something that I think artists really need to understand, which is that people aren't thinking about you. So tell them what they need to think about you. 100%. And then what I react really well to is when an artist comes to me and they say, this is my art form. This is what I'm trying to achieve. I would like to do this. And they're not then pressuring you to give them something. They're just educating you so that, in a month's time, two months' time, somebody gets in touch with me and they say, look, I'm looking for an artist that does X, Y, or Z. I can say, oh, this artist, I know that they're polite, I know they're organized, and I know that they're going to respond. So, you know, I will make those connections because that artist took the time to educate me on who they are and what they're trying to achieve. And that just makes life so much more easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think what I'm drawing out of this conversation really is that artists need to um, research galleries, research other artists, research cities that they want to be in, make a plan and then execute the plan. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to, you know, transform your career over a weekend because you made a plan and you live the plan. The plan should be over the next few years, I'm going to be present at these spaces. I'm going to be a face that's known. I'm going to connect with those galleries. I'm going to tell them who I am. And then I'm going to turn up to their things. So if I want to be shown in a gallery, I'm going to show myself in that gallery when they have an opening. Be there, not necessarily, you know, to make friends with them in that kind of underhand sort of way, but just be physically present and show that you have an interest in what they're doing. So it makes sense as why you want to be in that space. Right. It is very much like a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and it's, I think, a lot of people are uncomfortable with the uh, idea of networking because it seems very calculated or, mm -hmm. or um, opportunistic or commercial. And, um, and I understand that, you know, uh, so I actually, sometimes I just don't even use the word networking, you know, cause it has some negative connotations for people, but it's really connecting, right? It's, it's connecting with people in a real way um, and, um, and even if you're an introvert, you can connect with people, you know, you, you may not be as, uh, flashy or telling jokes or whatever in the situation, but you can still be there and you can still meet people. Um, and, um, and yeah, like what you're saying about if you know somebody's work and then somebody else is asking you like, Hey, I'm looking for an artist who does X. Do you know anybody? Well, yeah, you're going to go through your Rolodex of people and you're going to remember the people who also keep in touch, you know, mm -hmm. who, um, I mean, I have tons of artists who just send me, um, you know, I'm on their newsletter. Everybody should have a newsletter. If you're an active artist, um, it, you know, it can be social media, it can be Instagram, but it, I, I, I still like, I mean, email, I still like getting an email uh, that is like, Hey, here's what I'm working on. And you're not asking me for a show. 
you're just sharing your work so that when that moment it's a long game people it's a long it's a long game <laughs> right this is something that i got from an artist oh nice the way he networks is he sends a greetings card at the end of every year and if you're on his list of people then you get a, a nice little greetings card which you want to keep because it's a nice thing yeah. and um it's just a polite reminder. I'm here. I'm still working. Mm -hmm. uh, I've evolved to this or, you know, my work has moved to this, this way. You don't need to network like every weekend. You don't need to be super on top of that, but just have a plan as to how you want to keep in touch with those galleries that you want to be in touch with or those other artists or other curators right. that you want to be in touch with. And then just keep at it. Just, just, yep. and, um, I love introverted artists. They are my favorite people for networking at receptions because they come up to you, they know the three things they want to tell you, and then they leave. <laughs> they don't hammer the same three things at you for 20 minutes trying to persuade you of something because you know everybody's there. They're all trying to exchange information like greetings cards. And then the, you, know, the, you don't want to be trapped in a corner by that one increasingly awkward conversation do your networking and then politely remove yourself that shows so much confidence oh you... peter can't they have a drink too <laughs> they, can, they can but if they could do that with their friends <laughs> no i mean yeah it's lovely for people to have like a, you know, a genuine interaction but if you are networking and it is a first time you're meeting them it doesn't need to be more than like 90 seconds yeah and that's yeah. great you you remember them you know yeah, I mean, I, I, when I, um, I went to the art fair with my curator, she was laughing. She goes, Hey, you know what I've learned from you? I'm like, what? She goes, how to work the room. <laughs> so we were laughing about that because, you know, like even in a situation like that, okay, here's this fair and it's giant and there's like, ugh, what do we want to see here? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's like, do we want to see the LA galleries? Do I have any special interest in Berlin? Do I want to like focus in on looking at those galleries? Do I want to go talk to my friends? Like the people who run galleries and they're my friends, I know them and I like the artists they're showing. I want to go and show my face and show support for what they're doing and compliment their show and support their show. Um, you know, what, what are we there for? Um, are we looking for artists that, are people that we could maybe work with that would fit in with a project that we're working on. So like, what's your goal? And, um, and again, us going together, we know different people. We have a lot of overlapping friendships, but, you know, she's 20 years younger than me. So, you know, has a different set of contacts and friendships. And so as we're working the room together, we're also introducing uh, uh, each other you know, to other friends that we have. So it, it increases the amount of people you can meet and connections you can make, you know? Um, Davina was asking a question in the chat. Should we go to your question? So you're in Santa Cruz, cool. Um, I am, hi, Sarah. I'm so enjoying your talk. I just, all the suggestions that you both of you have are wonderful for a, an extreme introvert like myself. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I grew up in LA, but um, I've lived here for a, a very long time. And um, I'm re-emerging on the local art scene after, you know, I had to be away for uh, a couple of years. So I'm kind of starting over again. Um, but, I'm, you know, making a lot of connections with the local, there's two main local art galleries mm -hmm. and I've become members of those and um, I'm applying for a grant uh, given by the Arts Council here, but it's hard. And, it, you know, it, it was easier um, before my career pause because I was, I just was in the educational institute I was in, it was just, the connections were all there. They were just there. Yeah. You know, so I was in a lot of shows and it was easy and it flowed. And now I'm not connected with that anymore. And it's, um, 
you know, I'm a shy person. And, and also I seem to be doing, I'm doing abstract work now. Mm -hmm. And, um, Nobody's fallen in love with it except me. <laughs> and just one more thing, and then I'll be quiet because when I get a chance to talk to somebody, I just start talking. <laughs> um, uh, um, Stan Welsh, I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He is an amazing sculptor. Um, he does uh, big heads, enormous heads. And I took a workshop with, with, with him and he said, when I went into my studio thinking about the market, nothing happened. When I went into my studio wanting to create what I needed to create, everyone wanted my work. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's what I follow, even though, you know, nobody's fallen in love with my work right now. You know, Davina, it's funny because abstract painting like was out for a little while, but it's back yeah. again. Good. <laughs> it's back. <laughs> It's back. Um, in fact, what's interesting is uh, within the Black artist community, mm -hmm. there's a reemergence of abstraction because there was like an expectation that every Black artist was going to create um, narrative painting around the Black experience, right? And a lot of Black artists were pushing back on that. They're like, hey, I'm not here to like you know, do something anthropological, I'm, you know, making art. And so a lot of them have in, well, a handful of artists I know have actually intentionally pivoted to abstraction mm -hmm. to kind of just remove all that cultural reference stuff ent entirely. Although it's still in there, you know, there's still, there's still other conceptual um, connections to culture that, that may be there. It just may not be as on the surface. So, um, so I wanted to just say that, but you know, where you are too, the thing about being in a smaller town is, uh, maybe there are fewer artists and less competition, right? Mm -hmm. And when I say competition is like, there are only so many slots maybe for a gallery, so many artists they can show in a, in, in a group exhibition, whatever. So, so, you know, when I say don't be competitive, I mean, there is some inherent competition in this, just like when you apply for a job, right? But there are also fewer opportunities where you are. So like you said, there are two main galleries. So that's kind of very limiting, you know, if you don't fit in with what they're doing or every artist in Santa Cruz wants to show with them. So, um, you know, there are art competitions and you can enter things all over the country, all over the world. Um, you know, uh, I did that when I was a young artist, you know, just, just also, you know, it's just a good exercise. Uh, then there, then there are artist residencies mm -hmm. and there are artists, um, prizes. Um, and so like the big ones that you know about, obviously like the Guggenheim, right. Mm -hmm. And I like write letters of recommendation every year for artists for the Guggenheim. I write letters of recommendation every year for creative capital, um, which is also quite a quite interesting um, national prize. Then in LA, there's uh, the Cola Award. It's the city of LA. It's a $10,000 award for like, I guess they usually pick like five or six artists who are mid-career artists, not emerging artists, um, people who've been at it um, and maybe haven't gotten recognition. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I've learned is that um, artists who win one of these like local awards, then your name's on a list, right? And then when people are looking for artists for things, they might look at those lists and then they might go, oh, I don't know that I don't know half of these artists. And then they'll go and look at their websites and they'll look at their work. Mm -hmm. And so um, also people apply to that, um, like that COLA award, and they don't get it. I have tons of friends who like apply. I've written letters of recommendation for so many people who have not gotten those awards, but then one year they do get it, right? There's the, it's their time, they get it. And then it puts them on that list and on the map, and then they apply for the higher profile grant. And maybe they have to try three times for that one until they get it. So 
a lot of times we feel like like what we'll see people we know who get a big award and we're like how come they got it or it seems like you know but they've been at it they keep applying you know and they try not to get bummed out when they don't get selected because there's next year you know um and you just really kind of have to do that um some people may really need it financially right. to, to, to do certain things to support themselves. And for others, it's really about um, prestige, or I would say more importantly, encouragement that it's the, when you get selected, it's encouragement that you're on the right track, you know, that someone's recognizing your work. And a little, a little of that goes a long way, you know, it, it, it lifts your spirit, right. To be selected. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of where you are, I mean, it's just a really tough thing. Like again, creating your own opportunities, finding other abstract painters in Santa Cruz and maybe putting your own show together somewhere. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Why not? Mm -hmm. Or pair yourself with figurative artists and mix it up, you know? Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, there, there's also this arena around like vanity projects and um, curating yourself into a show, which is usually a no-no. Like we actually, in our Emerging Curators program, we ask curators not to propose their own work for a show. Mm -hmm. However, I will say that's usually true in certain settings, but that rule has been breaking down and, um, and that rule um, and that um, these entrepreneurial kind of things, which I would consider as being more about artists supporting each other and, and an art community, putting a show together yourselves without the gatekeeper, right? is like, who cares? Who cares if you're one of the organizers and you're an artist in the show? Who cares? You're just going to do it and you're going to get people there to see the show and um, get people excited about it. And honestly, there are a lot of collectors who love to buy work in that way. It's just like, they don't, they don't care if somebody's a big name. They just want to buy art that they want to live with and look at. You know? Well, yeah, Sarah, thank you so much. I'm so impressed with how much you understand the psychology of artists. You know, it's oh just my like, God. <laughs> it's, no, I, I mean, I can imagine what you've been through with artists and probably with yourself as a creative person to, to understand this so well. But it's, um, I think, you know, one of the things I'm getting is just is be persistent. And, you know, one of the shows I applied for recently um online was it's was, was called persistence <laughs> so thank you so much sarah yeah sure you bet um yeah i mean um being persistent it's a long game you know i you know i worked in the art schools for over 30 years so um i worked at rhode island school of design where i went to art school I worked at Otis College of Art and Design. I worked at Art Center College of Design in LA and Pasadena. And so I've worked with art students and that's why I understand, you know, what artists are about. Um, and um, what was gonna be my point about the art schools? Oh my God, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, oh, it, it, you, you just have to, you just have to, do the work. I, when I worked with art students, I would always say, if you're choosing fine art, it really should be because you're compelled. Right. And okay. because the art schools I worked at were really more design institutions, design education institutions, because that's where the majority of the work is. And so I would say to people, do not choose fine art unless you really mean it because it is not for the faint of heart. Um, and if you are super attracted to some of these other design fields, just do them. And, you know, you can always make your, uh, your art, um, you know, in addition to that, but you have to really feel compelled to make it. 
because uh, it's hard. <laughs> so the, the wonderful joke about um, making money in the arts world, which is um, how, how to make a small fortune in the arts, start out with a large one. <laughs> yeah. So, um, there's also there's a wonderful art gallery in um, in the north of England in a, an old industrial um, city, and um, they, they took a, a foundry and they turned the foundry into an amazing art space, and they named it Persistence Works. Oh, great! Love it. Very I cleverly it. done. Yeah. So the, my last question um, is about um, you know. LACE with its curatorial program has seen dozens, if not hundreds of artists coming through uh, the, the exhibitions that have been um, being presented. And I was hoping you could talk to me about artists that you've seen that have really made the most of that exhibition opportunity. What have they done that's really made that opportunity work for them? Yeah, um, well, I do have one artist in mind. Um, Again, I think sometimes things are kind of organic and not necessarily super planned, like people don't necessarily have all the steps laid out of how they're going to get there. But um, the artist I'm thinking about is Rafa Esparza, uh, E-S-P-A-R-Z-A, -A, and you can look him up on our website. So Rafa um, did a project with us, um, I think it was like 2016 maybe, and it was, I'll describe it to you. And if you dig on our website, um, you'll be rewarded with a wonderful um, time-lapse video that we did of uh, him creating this artwork, which included around 3000 handmade Adobe bricks. And an Adobe brick in his case is like this big, not like a little brick, right? A big brick. And um, he made the bricks at the gallery uh, and brought in tons of, um, uh, made some of the bricks at the gallery, made some of the bricks offsite by the LA River. Uh, they're a mixture of earth, water from the LA River that he brought up and uh, horse dung and hay, right? So that's the like Mexican formula for adobe bricks. And his father taught him how to make that. His father was from Mexico. And um, he was a young queer artist who had a hard time with his father uh, understanding him. And they became close through the process of this like mentorship around making bricks, learning how to make these bricks. So he made this giant, um, we painted the gallery all white, including the floor. And he created this giant curved brown space within the gallery, um, transforming the space. And it, um, it still is like one of the most um, important exhibitions that I was involved with, um, almost like from an emotional perspective, because it was uh, so tra transformative. Um, this, this artwork, um, transform sound and smell and everything you know and we we let the dirt just like accumulate in the gallery it was was really amazing so after his uh, or during his show with us he had a visit with a curator um who was working on made for uh, made in la um so made in la is a big biennial that's done at the hammer museum here in la and it uh, features um, you know, it could be like 20 artists from Los Angeles. And so this artist, Rafa, was selected for the Made in LA show. So our exhibition with him really became a platform for him to get that next step in his career, which was to be in this Made in LA biennial, which is a pretty big deal, yeah. um, being selected, you know, amongst all the artists in LA. And the curator came to meet with Rafa at LACE to see this project, because it's not the kind of thing you're going to go and see in someone's studio. It was like, you know, on site. And I have to say, like, that was really gratifying for me and my team to, you know, have his work make that next step. And then two years later, he was in the Whitney Biennial. 
So then on the national art scene, being a nationally recognized Latino artist from LA. But um, and one thing I want to share about Rafa is that this, this idea about generosity between artists, every time Rafa has an opportunity, he brings others with him. So um, during his show at Lace, he created this whole like performance art series where we had people come and do performances within this Adobe structure, right? So um, uh, those artists got to be, fe be featured. When he got the Whitney Biennial show, this is like unheard of. He actually cut his allotted space into sections and invited friends to come and be in the Whitney Biennial with him. Who does that, right? Yeah. Kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, and like, that's like, that's like putting your money where your mouth is. Yeah. Like I'm giving, literally giving up real estate that I own in the Whitney Biennial to my friends. And it's a pretty special thing, you know? So, uh, and this is very big in my world is the collective and the um, looking out for others. Hmm. It's really a big part of the, a big part of the ethos of our space and, and the artists that we work with. I think what strikes me there is this, is Rafa didn't want a show because it's a show he wanted a show as a platform for the next step in his career and he understood that each show each moment that you are given that uh, spotlight you need to make an impact you need to know what you want to achieve with that spotlight because it you're going to be back in the studio for like the next nine months working away and that spotlight's moving off so i think artists if they think the show is the end point in the arc then they're not understanding that the show is the point in which you invite everybody that you want to be involved in your next step to come to this step, witness you now, help you get to the next point. So I really like that idea of, you know, he's made this beautiful work and then inviting others to animate that work, bringing them into his show to do these performance pieces, because that's going to then make his work all the more interesting because it connects to other pieces. So that generosity of, you know, and that confidence to know that you can, that your work still stands up and it won't be just put into the background. I mean, that's really, that's a really impressive individual. Yeah, he is. He is. But look, look him up uh, on the lace on the lace website. Just go to the archive section and you know put it in, and look for the time lapse video. Um, I had to kind of fight him to do it. He didn't want to do it at first <laughs> because he said it'll make it look like my work was really easy. And I'm like, <laughs> so it was was an interesting comment because we did his show over the summer and he literally was in the gallery like sweating through his clothes it was you know we have really crappy air conditioning and you know i mean we our front door um um at the time we're going to improve on this in our new gallery space the the double doors as you come into the gallery were not wide enough for a pallet to fit through so you know, like yeah. so we had like pallets of these bricks mm -hmm. that he made but we had to literally put them in wheelbarrows and bring them in like five at a time and you know i'm i moved a handful of those suckers myself um and they were heavy you know each one was like 30 pounds um of like compressed earth so um, a very physical, that was part of the point of this art project is the labor behind it. Um, and he didn't want it to look like it just was easy, you know, like boop, it came, you know, came up. So what we, we came up with was, well, let's put all the days, let's put all the days listed. Mm -hmm. So as the, as the time lapse goes by, you can see it's weeks of yeah. work putting yeah. this thing together. It's, it's quite something. Yeah. yeah.